And Father, we look forward to that day when the skies will part. And we will look up and we will see thy blessed Son coming to claim us for his own. And so we look forward to that day, but in the meantime, we are here. Help us to occupy to let us come, Lord Jesus. So we just pray for a blessing on our time together now, listening to our brother Tim uh, open thy word. We just pray, encourage him, and give him words from thee for us. So we just pray for a blessing on this time together in thy name. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here and be able to share the word with y'all. I've been uh, wrestling with what to think from, and I decided this is something we haven't talked about in a long time. What do we believe? How do we practice? What? How do we do church? Oh, that's why. Uh, it went down to the floor. <laughs> Sorry. Is that good? Much Okay. About, um, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, I forget. That would have been 40. <laughs> About 30 years ago, I, uh, John's involved with camp. Back in those days, I was too. And there was a um, a need. There was struggle between church assemblies that had differing opinions on the doctrine of the camp. Because you go up, you send your kids up to camp from every, every assembly, and some were doing something different that we didn't want, or those people didn't want, we wanted. And there needed to be camaraderie agreement. This is what we'll teach at camp for the kids you send up. There was a, a little battle that went on, not bloody, <laughs> but there was differing opinions. And I was asked by some of the elders in other assemblies if I could represent Bethel Chapel. I didn't feel qualified because one of the requirements was to be an elder. I thought, oh, uh, sorry, I can't right now. I I, I don't, I'm not an elder at Bethel Chapel. So I came and talked to Steve's dad, Cal Bishop. I said, Tim, you're an elder. He said, no one told me. That's awesome. I've been going to the elder meetings, elder deacon meetings, and that kind of stuff, talking about what needs to happen to the church to make it better. And I said, I don't feel qualified. And he said, uh, well, what's wrong? And I said, well... I have a child that isn't obedient to the Lord right now. And he says, is this child at home? And I said, no, he's moved out. He's living somewhere else. Oh, I told you it wasn't candy, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's not living with us now. And Cal says, Tim, the scripture says he keeps his household. The elder keeps his household in order. Right now, your son isn't part of your household. Now, if he came back in, then you'd have to have some rules you laid down. So we did. And it all worked out good for my son. And uh, I was good, glad for that. But being an elder was nothing, something I really strove for. I wrestled with. Because I knew the passage in Scripture that says God's going to hold the elders accountable for what they decide. That's an ouch. That's not said of deacons. But it's said of elders. Here in these uh, doctrines that we support here at Bethel Chapel, but you might not, so I can just look for it. I just want to go down this list. Christ is the head of this church. I'm going to be talking about this is called church government. How do you run church? How does it work? And in this assembly, we have elders, we have deacons, we have leaders. And together, that all makes the church work and run smooth. Um, there have been times we've had disagreements within our assembly. 
we're not there right now. It's a wonderful thing. This last decade or two has been wonderful. Who's the head of the church? Christ is the head of the church. Now, you can go into many churches and say, who's the head of the church here? And they'll say, let's have a pastor over there. Now, this might be uh, sounding a little hoity-toity that we say, oh, but Jesus Christ is the head of our church. But it's not intended to be that way. It's intended to recognize that I'm nothing compared to him. He is the head of the church. I need to look in his word and see what he says to do. There's no other head. It's a one-headed church. Uh, so if someone said, take me to your leader, you walk to the door and say, oh, you want me to introduce you to Jesus Christ? Because he is the head of the church. Now, we're an independent, undenominational church. What does that mean? It means we don't have a headquarters. We don't have uh, people in charge that are telling us, oh, we changed the doctrine. Now you have to teach this. Or you're still behind in your payment. <laughs> or we understand you're teaching this, and you're going to have to toe the line here. Um, this is independent, undenominational. Some 40 years ago, I looked in the yellow pages because it was broken down by churches that had denominations under there. You could find which denomination you wanted. There was undenominational and non-denominational. And between those two, there were two churches there. <laughs> it was us and Harvest. And in all of Riverside, I thought, well, okay, we're in good company. <laughs> Fellowship. We don't have a membership here. You don't become a member of Bethel Chapel and then when you leave here, you have to get a membership at that new church. But what we have is called a fellowship. So when someone comes to the assembly here and they want to break bread and be part of our assembly, we say, oh, well, let's sit down uh, and talk about this. What does it mean to be in fellowship at Bethel Chapel? Now, we haven't been strict about this, but this is the plan that when we have new people come in, we'll say, well, we have three requirements. You have to have lots of money. Uh, we have three requirements. Oh, let's see. I don't have it here, but we have three requirements. Socks. One is three. Okay. Number three? Four? Three. Oh, saved. Oh, yeah. Fellowship versus membership. Yeah. You have to be saved. In other words, we talk to you. When when did you come to know Christ since you're saying right? Someone might say, I don't know, man, but I do know I'm trusting them as my Lord and Savior now. And we'll talk further about it. Number one, they need to be saved. Number two, they not need to not be living in practice sin. That means confess your sin. And God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we have a practice sin, boy, come, before you come in and break bread, we'd like you to just confess that to the Lord and give it back to him. And the third one was... Somehow lost on my page. No false doctrine. No false doctrine concerning Christ. Concerning Christ. Because there's pl plenty of people that have come in here and they have other doctrines, but they're not the essential ones. The essential ones are who is Jesus Christ? What did he do for us? He's God's son. He is God incarnate. And uh, he saved us from our sin. Uh, so there's no clergy. We have a plurality of leaders. Uh, we're all simply saints here, though. Um, no one-man ministry. A weekly Lord's Supper. We have a remembrance meeting that's devoted to teaching. As, uh, a remembrance piece is remembering him because in Acts 2.42, it says, here's what you need to do as a church. You need to have teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Four things a church should do. Some people do it once a month, some twice a year, breaking bread. We do it every week. And we're doing that because the apostles did that. Here in, the, in Acts, it says they broke bread after the Lord uh, raised from the dead. They broke bread the next week, and they broke bread the next week. We thought, hey, we'll just continue that. So that's uh, something that we do. Other people don't. And that's okay. It's good to break bread with other people when they do. Um, 
finances. We don't solicit finances. Send you a mailer saying uh, you're behind. Um, we, uh, we just uh, as people desire, we do it at breaking the bread. And the reason we do it there is we know there are believers there. They've come in here and to remember the Lord with us, and they're already believers. We don't want to take money from unbelievers. Um, they took it from the church when we looked at New Testament practices. Um, we have a doctrine concerning men and women and their part in, in, in here. And that's what Matthew's going over in his class now, uh, the women's role in the, in the church. And so if you want to learn more about that, he's going on for another four weeks. At least. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's good there. It's not like women, we don't want you to do anything. We're going to do it all. Boy, we depend on women to do all this uh, service. They look here at the counter and what they do, it's wonderful. And you look at the how clean that place is. Guess who does that? Ian Sylvia. And Sally sometime and other people sometime. So turn to First Timothy chapter three. By the way, we didn't make up those doctrines. Uh, we found it in a book somewhere. It's called the Bible. And uh, we inherited how the practice goes on, and we're happy to follow that till Christ comes down. First Timothy chapter three. It is a trustworthy statement if any man aspires, that means to reach out as to grasp something. If any man aspires, the office of an overseer is a fine work he desires to do. It's a fine work he longs to do. <clears throat> some people long to do it. Some people go in kicking and screaming, saying, I have to obey the Lord. But it's something that if a person desires to be a deacon or an elder, talk to the elders here. And I'd like you to consider it. But regarding everyone here, these passages that we're going to be going over, these qualifications for being an elder. There we go. Here are the requirements. Uh, these are to be a deacon. And we don't recognize deacons here in this assembly because virtually everyone already is doing that deacon work. Being a servant for the Lord, doing what you can, and many, many different avenues of service, whether it's stacking chairs, uh, you guys do that and you, you preach too. So deacons, we have a, a good body of deacons here. And women, you know, I'm sorry, my heritage says no, women can't be deacons, but they can be, um, I believe. And so we need to recognize that these qualifications, these are qualifications. Next time I speak, hopefully I'll be speaking on what are the responsibilities of health. And then we'll dig into the, the work of deacons. You know, look at the requirements in the yellow column. Those are the deacons. And on the right three columns, those are the elders. And I bet if you look at those, you could say, hey, I do that. I, I'm, I'm good at that part. I'm self-controlled and I'm prudent, I'm respectable, I'm hospitable, I'm able to teach. And so these are not reach for the sky. You know, you have to fulfill all these requirements in order to do things. These are things every believer should be able to do. So let's look at them one at a time. Paul if Paul wrote to Timothy regarding this church, and I'm putting words in his mouth, so this isn't from scripture, he'd say, you need to look for good, honorable, noble men. Because that's what he was doing to Timothy here in this passage. You need to fill those seats of elders in your church. It's growing now. He says, it's not a light matter to shepherd God's people. These new elders must care for souls they will be feeding, guarding, guiding, nurturing these. These men need to look out at the saints as valuable persons, souls whom God saved. Here's Acts 20. I'll just read it. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. 
I hope you can see the magnitude that that is saying. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he purchased with his, his own blood. I mentioned about being valuable persons. Each one in here is someone that Christ died for. Isn't that something? You go to the garage to get your car work done. You can see a guy there that Christ died for. Now, people don't receive it sometimes, often. But they're still important, valuable people in God's sight. And so the mark of an elder, someone with the qualifications, looks at people differently. And we all should, shouldn't we? This isn't just elders. Second Corinthians 5.20 says, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God is making his appeal through us. <clears throat> now, isn't that a heavy load? God has asked each of us to be his amb ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. That's all of our calling, not just the elders. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2. Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Everybody in here needs to fulfill that. Walk in love. This is our path. That's the path of a Christian, one of love, compassion. Verse 2, an overseer, that, there's two words for that that they use interchangeable, interchangeably as an overseer and an elder throughout the Testament. An overseer then must be blameless and above reproach. Now, I'm going to talk about this one a little bit because beyond reproach addresses all of the ones underneath. In other words, no one has any qualm against you if you're above reproach. This person must currently qualify for the task and position, not hopefully someday I want to be an overseer. Currently, right now, every one of us should make a, a pattern in our life to be above reproach, beyond reproach. In other words, no one can point at you and say, here's what's wrong with that guy. He's not a real believer, or he is not acting like a Christian. Elders are not perfect, nor above accusation. I want to show you something here. I drew something up here. It's to illustrate a point Bobby brought to me yesterday, and Priscilla brought it to her years ago. There's a difference between of being blameless and being faultless. And it says here that we should be blameless. That's the word it uses. A three-year-old child was asked to take a crayon and draw the letter A. And this is what they came up with. Is it faultless? No. Nope. It's not faultless. There are problems with that, isn't there? It's not a proper A. Is the three-year-old child blameless? They're three years old. What's that, Steve? Yes. Do you go for yes? Okay. We'll give them an A. Then. So so they they a. <laughs> that kind of A. Elders are not perfect, nor above accusation. J. Vernon McGee, when he was beginning his ministry, uh, Someone that was teaching uh, was kind of his master. He came, went to him. He, he, he looked at him as, oh, he's good. He's a good preacher. And the guy says, so how are things going for you? He goes, not too good. He says, I'm getting a lot of accusations, blame and criticism. And he says, um, the guy says, well, you know what? Satan would love for you to be disabled. I want you to examine each one of the things you've been accused of. Looking at scripture, ask other leaders if they see this in you. And if you come up with a no and a no, discard it. You don't even need to go back to them and give them an account. 
because they were pestering him. And he says, and from there, move on in the strength God gives. It's a good thing to know that your leaders are fallible just as you are. Leaders should have consistent Christ-like conduct that gives us no reason to accuse anyone. Leaders should have consistent Christ-like conduct that gives no reason for anyone to accuse them of anything. That should be our pattern of life. This com character combines all the following behaviors and attitudes that we're going to be talking about. First Peter 5, 3 says, be examples to the flock. Be examples to the flock. You don't want someone that is leading the church to be one that isn't a high standard to reach. It needs to be someone that has character. One of the reasons I chose this subject and slowly get into the content uh, was we've had a number of people leave Bethel Chapel recently, move, and they don't live around an assembly. So how do they find a good church? My son lives 45 minutes away. And he says, Dad, I want, I want to find a better church than I'm having. They're, they're off in their doctrine. Well, he got spoiled here, I think. <laughs> and so I look, went online, and I look at each one, and every website doesn't tell you what they really believe or practice. But you can look at some of the pictures, and some of them are really different. <laughs> and so what I want to do is with everyone here and the kids that you have at home and they're looking for a church, what should they look for in a church? Be imitators of me, even as I am also Christ. Paul had his failings, so I don't think he meant be an imitators of me every bit of the person I am and act like. I think he was saying be imitators of me in those areas that I am Christ-like. Because if he didn't mean that, I... <clears throat> so I think we all should recognize everyone has faults, including the elders. The only true 100% role model is Jesus. Now, I believe shared leadership allows each leader to recognize the faults in themselves. And this goes with you all. You're looking at people. How can I emulate that kind of person because that person is beyond fault it seems well find those patterns in your life that you say i need to adapt that life now i don't know about you but i pictured a lot of us are like a reverse onion i mean you would start with nothing we just put on layers of people that we admire and not that we're mimicking them but we recognize that is a godly trait and i need that in my life You've heard people say, I'm trying to find myself. And so they start peeling off the onion pieces until they find out they're nothing. But what you were emulating is people like Christ. I want to be more like Paul Freeman, how he pauses before answering. I want to be like Wayne and Carmen, their faithfulness to the assembly, even though they drive how far? How far do you drive from home? It's about 15 minutes. Yeah, almost 60. It took an hour to Yeah. I want to be like that. I don't want to live far away so I can be like <laughs> But I want that character in me that I want to look at Bethel Chapel as something. I got to be here. I, I've got to be here. That's what they, they, they are. I want to be like Mike Clark who is hyper aware, hyper aware of how people are doing. Where's Mike? He left. He left. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like Mike in some areas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we're still in verse two. He's probably finding out how people are really feeling. <laughs> All right, the husband of one wife. That's one of the requirements of, a, of, of an elder. Now, I look at this list and I say, husband of one wife. I remember talking to Bill McDonald years ago. He was in a conference in Pomona. And there was a group of us went up to him. He was, you know, he's written all these books. He's famous. 
So we wanted to talk to him. And he said, oh, do you attend an assembly? And he says, yes, I have a regular assembly I attend. We said, are you an elder there? And he goes, no. Why not? And he says, well, I know it sounds funny, but I, I'm convicted of this. And other people aren't, but I've never been married. And so I don't feel like qualify. And that was an interesting thing because he, it says here they need to be the husband of one wife. There's other people, and I lean this way, but the elders have never come up with a, a decision on this matter. We've never had to. But um, there were three other, uh, two other options. Either, let's see if I can find it. Uh, oh, here. Either you must have a wife or you've never been married or you're not a womanizer. In other words, um, can a person be an elder even though they are not married, they never were married? I would think yes, if this assembly decides that way. Um, the other one is, I'm not a womanizer. And I think that's what the writer was coming at. The husband of one wife. I have one wife. All the other ladies that might be attractive and all that, I'm not interested in. That's my woman. I'm not a womanizer. Does that make sense? Yes. And that the elders should not be a womanizer. But each assembly needs to decide for themselves how they're going to do church. I'll probably get one, one maybe two of these done. Sober-minded. We're still on verse two, aren't we? Sober-minded. Now, that means vigilant. He gets to alcohol later. But vigilance is one of the things a shepherd of the flock should be. You think about a shepherd out in the field, and they're out in the open, and the sheep are scattered. Is the shepherd playing video games? <laughs> Probably not. He shouldn't be. Right now. <laughs> the elders should be vigilant. They should be taking note like Mike is right now. And we're just guessing. <laughs> but shepherds should be vigilant of the sheep. It says here, um, sober minded. Um, Bobby and I watched a documentary on an army sniper. So they have this sniper go up to the top of the hill. They had, you know, a video of him doing this. And so he sets up. There's his, his comrades down there. They're going door to door, knocking on doors, seeing if the enemy is there. So he's up above with a sniper scope and a rifle. And he's going to take someone out if they start to attack his group. Um, there's another guy right next to him. He's an observer, an overseer. And he's got binoculars. He has a wider view. This guy just has, you know, I'm looking through my scope. <laughs> so this team of two becomes a good, vigilant team that watches for the enemy. I don't know where the verse is, and I'm probably out of step in saying it at this point. But there's a passage in one of the epistles that says wolves are coming. So this is something on the elders' radar. Um, wolves are coming. And the overseers look for the health, feeding, protection, injury, new pastures. And we should be doing it all the time. We shouldn't be watching YouTube and all that as long as there's daylight. Self-controlled is the next one. Safe, sound, curbing your impulses. Self-controlled. This is for everyone. And it's, we all should be self-controlled. Um, seems everyone today is extreme, aren't they? And it just comes out of their mouth and blah. Everything they've been watching on YouTube and all these other things. And you go, oh, okay. <laughs> You know, or you could say, yeah, right, let's get them. Or I'm not on your side. And so it's very polarized. The shepherd should be 
less like that. Self-control. Limit your extremes. Guard your words. Make every opportunity a chance to witness. If you meet a woke person, you don't have to tell them how bad woke is. Whatever it is. You should talk to them about the Lord. And how do you get that in? It isn't by bashing them. And so we as evangelists, as leaders in a church, need to be sympathetic. That should be our rule. Anthony Campolo had a video that was talking about, he's very funny. He was a preacher that we used to get in here and on the screen and watch him. He was a funny guy, a lot of good things he said. He said, I would not make a good psychologist. I could sit at the table with this couple that's having marital problems. And I would sit and I'd listen to their problems. And I'd go, <laughs> He says, I just want to strangle them. You're messing up your marriage. Do what's right and just get out of here. So that's not an elder. Um, Self-control. Listening and not talking as much. When we were kids, we didn't have a TV. So we had to make our own fun. So playing army and stuff like that, that was fun. But sometimes I just want to relax. So sometimes I remember, in my mind, this was fun. We'd lay out, on, lay out on the grass and we'd take a blade of grass and we'd tickle the other person's face until it scratched. <laughs> And you get down around here, and, and the goal was, I have more control than you do. Um, self-control, self-restraint is the name of the game for all of us. I'll ask you, are you sexually pure this week? Were you? You don't need to answer. Do your eyes linger long on an explicit picture? Can you stop scratching? That's really what it is. It's an itch that you feel just needs to be scratched. I need to look longer. Um, we need to control our desires through the power of the Holy Spirit and not scratch the itch. I'm going to end there. Um, we'll pick this up another time. Oh, I didn't go to the last one, did I? Warning to the church, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. And of course, I put the warning down there. It's your coming. So I just want to encourage you all to pray for your leaders, not just in this assembly. Pray for everyone. We're all part of the flock. Um, those of you that have an inkling or a desire to be more involved in church leadership, uh, deepen the list is a lot shorter. <laughs> it start there, but I do want you, if you'd like to get one of the books, I pass them to the leaders uh, in the assembly. I have, I don't have any more, but I can order whatever's needed. And it's on the deacons. There's another one that we have that's on eldership. One of them's that thick. Uh, but we have small ones too. But I want you to consider these elders are getting old. <laughs> Some of you are too. Sorry. <laughs> but let's think about this church and pray for it that we uh, survive the generation gap and maybe more better pray the Lord comes. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word that guides us in all truth. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would work within each one of us, convincing us of sin, convincing us we need to be respectable, above reproach, to everyone we contact, and even in our own hearts, our own minds, that we would be beyond reproach. We pray for self-control, and we pray, Lord, for this assembly and its growth. In Jesus' name, amen.